Thank you for joining today. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Optimizing Process Value for Internal Customers. It is my pleasure today to introduce our speakers. Stephen Slate has over 30 years of experience at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory and is a senior process analyst in the sorry, laboratory planning and performance organization. Stephen is currently applying his mechanical engineering background and extensive operational experience to re-engineer their R&D processes and tools to increase the effectiveness and efficiency of their operational processes. Chris Yardley has over 30 years of experience also at the Pacific Northwest National Lab Laboratory and is currently the team lead and business and process analyst in the laboratory planning and performance organization. In this role, he works with internal customers in strategic planning, finance, human resources, project management, and contract to help them understand their current state and formulate an improvement agenda to make their business areas not just better, or better, but not, not just different. Sorry, gentlemen. Um, without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to you. All right, thank you, Holly. I'm Chris, I'll get things started here. I guess first off, those are pretty lofty introductions. Steve and I are a couple of guys have been doing this for a long time. Wanna share some of the things we've done, hopefully, you get something out of it, maybe a nugget here or there, something you can apply to your business as well. Um, I know when I come to these things, it's helpful to have a little bit of a feel for where the speakers are coming from, what who they work for, you know, kind of the business of, of what they do. So I will do a little bit of that and I'll turn it over to Steve. So Steve, hit the next slide if you would, please. So Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Some of you may have heard of the National Lab System. Most people haven't, but there's 13 labs across the country sponsored by the Department of Energy. And primarily we do research and development as you expect in the areas of energy, but also uh, the environment, national security, and some basic sciences. But the way I like to describe it in simple terms is we've got a whole bunch of scientists couple thousand scientists who are doing research and development for every kind of scientific discipline you can think of pretty much. So we're in the business of science and technology. We're in the business of research and development, um, much like professional, any other professional services organization, where primarily the Department of Energy would hire the scientists at the lab to do some research in different areas that they're interested in. In terms of size, we do about a billion dollars worth of business in a year. 5,000 people employed at the lab, a little pretty much half and half in terms of the scientists, the engineers, as well as the management and operations side of the house. In terms of the way the whole thing is structured, the Department of Energy sponsors the laboratory and they hire somebody to operate it for them. And the operator is Battelle. So we're actually employed by Battelle Memorial Institute out of Columbus, Ohio. So it's Battelle that operates the lab on behalf of the Department of Energy. And Battelle has several different labs uh, across the country now. So like I said, primarily want to give you a feel for what we do so you can compare and contrast against what you do. Professional services, science and technology delivering knowledge. In terms of our team, we're a fairly small team, handful of people, and the name of the team is business and process analysis. So lots of times we'll parachute into situations, help people understand what they're doing, what's working, what's not working, help put together roadmaps to make things better. Like Holly said in our intro, we're, one of our mantras is to help make the situation better, not just different. So, couple of people like Steve, who've been around for a really long time. Steve's actually retired and loves it so much that he came back. We have a couple of people in that situation, a couple of semi old timers like myself who've grown up in the organization and a couple of newcomers, early career people. So that's what we do. Hopefully you get something out of this today. Steve's got some great stuff and I'll turn it over to him. And Steve, you're on mute. 
So he gets the award well, being first person. So there we go. Yeah, well, somebody always has to do that. And so That's I'm right. glad it was me this time. Thanks, Chris, for getting us kicked off. So uh, we're going to present a case study today. This is uh, an exercise that we went through in our organization to try to uh, resolve some issues that we had. And by doing this, uh, our intent is to help you understand, basically, like Chris said, maybe some ideas that can help you uh, restructure internal processes. So they're basically seen as being more, more valuable, more accessible, less burdensome by um, our internal customers. Chris described the fact that we've got 2,500 scientists and engineers, and, and you might imagine they don't have a lot of patience for administrative kinds of uh, processes, and they're overloaded. They're trying to get a lot of project work done, providing value back to our uh, country in terms of solving critical missions. So, uh, We'll, we'll basically explain how to understand what your employees want and need, how to reconfigure the value propositions for internal processes uh, to make them more valuable. So uh, this slide is going to give you some context, uh, basically some context of what we're trying to do. So nearly all companies um, are designing processes, but certainly the outward facing processes, those delivering to external customers get the most attention. Uh, that's where they primarily invest in terms of improving and, and they focus on different things. Um, and we'll explain how our uh, efforts do focus on some things. Um, you know, if they're a commodity company, they're going to be focused on prices. Uh, if they're a tech company, they'll be the, the new wonderful benefits. If it's a service company like travel or banking, they're going to be doing things to engender uh, loyalty and create a positive experience. And so we'll see, um, and, and rightfully so, the emphasis uh, is greater on the external rather than the internal. Uh, for so there is less, but there's also basically a, a sort of skewed investment, and you can see uh, uh, in this modified figure on the on the right is is really in our organization historically we've typically focused on compliance uh, and to a less extent cutting costs. So uh, our contract with the Department of Energy really has two components. Chris showed that on that first slide. One is doing this, the research, but the other is operating their national laboratory, the department's national laboratory uh, in a compliant fashion. And so we put a lot of effort on compliance. And Joe, so just to be clear that, you know, the kinds of internal processes we're talking about are important uh, in terms of Lean Six Sigma, you would use the term no value added. Uh, they're certainly not waste, uh, but they're also not really delivering the immediate benefit to our external customers. So it's like managing requirements, planning, travel, uh, assessing performance, things like that. So we have these internal processes. Uh, you know, why do we why do we care? Why do we need to uh, create value for our internal customers? Why can't we just tell them to toughen up, um, do what's required? It's required, so you should do it. Uh, we're paying you, so just do the work. Uh, well, that would work if we were all robots, I suppose. But we're all human beings, and um, we assert that making our internal processes of greater value more aligned with what they're all trying to accomplish will get us even more efficiencies, better compliance. Because we were saying things like pushback. Um, uh, and so we would get less pushback. We expect quicker responses. Um, less rework from you know, low quality uh, submittals. 
We expect lower risks uh, and maybe even greater demand for, for some of our services. So this, I'll get into the case study. Uh, as Holly said, our organization is a performance management organization. So we're really wrapped up with assuring compliance with all those government requirements and enabling some aspects of research. So you see eight bullets there. Uh, basically, those were in eight different teams in our organization, managing the contract, managing all those requirements, assessing performance, uh, investigating events and reporting it to our customer, Department of Energy, business planning, managing business records. And then our, the last bullet on there is uh, our organization and you know, improving our business processes. And we were finding, uh, you know, we were having problems and, you know, we were getting late information. We weren't getting people doing what we thought, you know, we, we built it and they weren't coming and we needed to understand that. Uh, we asked them and they said, um, well, just a small aside, you know, talking about our researchers and I think they would all support this. They're all very skeptical of basically anything that the functional side levies on them. And so basically they were seeing no value impositions on uh, what they were trying to do. So we were sure that we could help our customers um, with their work, and but they couldn't see how we were gonna be helpful and we couldn't really see it either. So we needed a systematic approach to try to figure this out, you know, reframe the value, um, ultimately seeking more efficiency in the services that we delivered. So um, what you're seeing there in the terms of those process steps, uh, you know, there's, there's no great revelation there. Um, I guess the re real revelation of this is if you really want to do this, you need to get in and, uh, sweat the details and really understand what your services are, uh, what, who your customers are and what they need. What are they doing? What are their jobs? And we'll get into that in a little more detail. Um, do our services even line up with their jobs? Uh, how well are we delivering? And then these last two bullets on the slide are basically, um, what we were trying to address more broadly in this case study, we're not going to get into that in this webinar, but we did a, you know, some assessments on when we defined our services to really seek which ones we should uh, improve and prioritize those. So we had lots of questions uh, and not very many answers. So uh, identifying our services, uh, was much harder than we expected. You know, we pretty much thought, well, we knew what we were doing. Well, um, indeed, uh, we did not. Um, you remember from the two slides back, the uh, eight bullets, well, those, each of those eight bullets were in a separate team and those teams were stovepiped. Uh, nobody really knew what anybody else was doing. Um, if we had anything written down, it was in different lo locations, different formats. Um, when it was written down, it was usually in business jargon at a very high level, so you really had no granularity. And we were focused on requirements. And so this is a uh, maybe a little bit unique to our organization, but there may be some of your companies as well that are in a highly regulated environment where we really had our processes and our IT systems designed to comply with requirements rather than to help us do research. Um, so we've had that sort of major discovery in part because of this case study and some other activities that have gone on that are similar to this case study where we've recognized that indeed uh, we are running a research organization and we should design processes and tools to support that. And then, by the way, make them compliant. So to help solve this problem, uh, 
we took those services and we broke them down. We wanted to get greater granularity. Um, now, basically we just rewrote the titles. So we rewrote the titles so we could actually tell uh, what the heck we were doing. Plain language, trying to get rid of jargon as best we could. We categorized them, then sorted and sifted them in a spreadsheet. And lo and behold, we were doing the same kind of thing in multiple groups. We hadn't recognized that. Uh, we found some things that we didn't even know we were doing. Uh, you know, we had some long time folks that was just their job. They did their job pretty much in secret and it was really never elevated. So we knew what was going on. Um, you know, and we had to we had to drill down. You know, when we first went out, but well, what do you do? Uh, we interview staff. Okay, well, why do you do that? Uh, well, we do it to assess performance, or we do it to investigate an event, or we do it to get functional requirements for an IT project. So that's the kind of sort of additional breakdown that we got. So we really knew what we were what we were doing. So uh, we've got that defined. We know what our services are. Uh, who are our customers? Uh, we had some idea. We pretty much knew who we were, uh, but we really had little idea what they did or how to support them. Well, why is that? Um, and this may be a common issue uh, in other organizations is we're a functional group. Most of the people in our organization are from other functional groups or were hired straight into our group. So really hardly anybody in our performance management organization had done research and really had no idea what researchers did. And by virtue of being just in this one group, they also had very little idea what other functional organizations did. But indeed, our customers are basically everybody in the lab. And we'll get into basically breaking that down into a little bit more detail. But we needed to do a process to understand what these folks did. Now, we chose to use an approach called value proposition design. That's put forward by the strategizer organization. Um, we happened to pick this because we had used it in some other activities at the lab. There are other approaches that are uh, equally valid uh, for doing just this kind of thing. Uh, this, to, to be fair though, to Strategizer is they are focused on commercial products, you know, principally a single product, really uh, fine tuning its value proposition to maximize profit. We took this into a little bit of an off book uh, application and I'll explain that. So uh, it's th very simple. Uh, there's no sort of rocket science here. The, the, the value is basically uh, sweating the details, doing the work. So understand what the jobs are, what our customers, what their tasks are, the problems they're trying to solve, the needs that they're trying to satisfy. And again, I, I made the point is we're dealing with human beings here. So uh, what are the pains and gains associated with the services that we were providing? Do our services annoy them? Do they impede what they're trying to accomplish uh, in terms of gains? Uh, there's certainly functional gains, but there's social and emotional ones. Um, you know, if, uh, we can do something that actually makes people feel good to have a positive experience. Um, we think that that will um, engender a better response. So uh, to a greater and lesser extent, as we developed this information, we tested it with the customers. Some we, so I guess our advice is really test all of these things well with your customers. We did with some customers, uh, but not with all. So uh, we got our services, we have our customers, we have our jobs. The strategizer approach is basically map those services to the customers. 
Now, this is uh, the strategizer value proposition canvas. Again, they focused on single products. And so they do a lot of, of, of detailed mapping with you know, stickies, you know, mapping gain creators to customer gains, et cetera. We really had to focus on basically just mapping the services to the jobs. And we took care of the pains and gains part of it in a little bit more general fashion because we were mapping 125 services to well over 100 different jobs that our um, six different customer groups had. So uh, let's talk about some specifics here. Uh, this is, um, oh, it was 150 uh, jobs, six main customers. So this table shows uh, basically researcher jobs. Uh, if you are in research, basically there should be no surprise here, but really getting it down on paper and looking at it and showing it to folks in our functional organization who had not done research, most of them just didn't really appreciate um, all of the things that our researchers are faced with and what they're trying to accomplish. But we had six customer sets, um, basically, ultimately, eventually, it's everybody in the lab, uh, but we have focused services on the leadership team, online management, for example, doing assessments, uh, compliance programs, again, doing assessments and managing requirements, uh, our project management office directors who oversee our project managers and our project managers and R&D staff do research. And then the functional staff uh, basically do the other functions in, in the lab. Um, so you can see, um, really, we have uh, our organization only touched less than half of the researcher jobs and to a um, not to a great extent. So even though we claimed that we were enabling research, uh, we weren't as much as we thought. And so uh, even on these specific things though, we were getting a lot of resistance and, and just in this one example, but it was across the board. And so we needed to improve. And that's uh, uh, basically our, the articulation of the value of what we had relative to what they were trying to accomplish. So I mentioned these pains and gains. Um, this slide here, uh, or the way we did that is we had a spreadsheet. We listed those six sets of customers. We identified the pains and gains. We prioritized those, but it was all on a single sheet. And by doing that, then we could sort and sift and we were able to find uh, a lot of common ground across the six different customers. So basically they wanted things to be free or affordable. Um, they wanted our answers to be reliable. Um, they wanted a quick response, uh, basically complete information. Uh, if we had multiple services, for example, that supported uh, a research projects, they wanted to talk to us once, not have to find the three different things that we did in three different parts of our organization. Um, to the extent we could add value rather than enforcing the rules, uh, helping the customers do their jobs more efficiently. Um, in part, we could do things basically for them. Uh, on our, for our functional customers, we had techniques that could reduce operational surprises, uh, problems, and audit findings. So, you know, we integrated services, we simplified. Uh, in some cases, we do it for them. Uh, in some cases, we just stopped doing some things because it really was not valuable. So, uh, we've got our jobs. We have our described, we have now granular set of services. We have the pains and gains. So what do we do with all of that? Well, we basically dumped that all into a big mail merge kind of thing. We created these one page templates uh, with the title at the top, the map jobs, 
We had the pains and gains in more detail than my slide showed you. And we said, okay, well, we now need to write some paragraphs. What is this service? Why do we do it? What requirements are we meeting? What is its value? Um, how good quality are our services? Um, how efficient are we? Do we have the capacity to do what uh, we're offering? You know, if we're offering that we can do something for free, do we have enough people to actually do that if everybody took us up on it? These last two points, number four and five, uh, are associated with that uh, evaluation that we did. So we could do some prioritization on uh, internally in terms of our improvement uh, budgets. If after this is over, you would like to have more detail on that evaluation, we do have the criteria we used and, and so forth. And we can share that with you uh, basically offline if you'd like. So to let's just give two examples. And then we'll tell you kind of what has happened subsequent to this case study in terms of uh, ongoing benefit to the organization. So, you know, we learned a lot when we were forced to succinctly describe our services from our customers' perspectives. We had not done that. So, for example, um, historically, we said, we have to turn in a report to the Department of Energy that assesses our performance. So you hereby are required to send us the following information. Uh, indeed, that was not uh, well embraced by our internal customers. But if we framed it uh, in terms of their perspectives, uh, we were getting a much better reaction. So in terms of assessment information, uh, we can help you see how your efforts are going and how you can do your own improvements by submitting, by collecting this information. And by the way, if you send it to us, uh, that will help us too. And so that's illustrated by further by this example here. You know, we have a customer. We now understand what their job is. Historically, what we did is we gave them a toolbox and said, good luck. I'm sure you can figure it out. Uh, uh, my apologies to IKEA, but here's an, basically a, an example of one of their assembly sheets. Um, here's how to do it. And by the way, we'll even help you do it. And so the, the, the grayed out box, you know, we used to have a service called quality assurance, period. That was it. So provide quality assured insights and advice for R&D project reviews. So when our projects come in, we hold reviews for them. Um, previously, we told the project manager, here, read this document, quality controls for project work. Now we say, and we are now doing, uh, our quality staff will recommend the QA approach that's appropriate for your new project We'll do that by reviewing your project documents, holding meetings with yourselves and your project people, um, with the project management office director. We'll come to uh, you know a collective agreement. If your quality assurance requirements are fairly straightforward, we'll write the plan for you for free. Uh, and if it's more complicated than that, we'll do it in an affordable way. And well, how could we do that? Well, our folks are typically lower charge out than some of these senior scientists. Uh, they were faster at it and they were better at it uh, because they do this all day, every day. And they understand the requirements, they understand the techniques, the tools that can be applied. And um, so we now have better plans at less cost to the project. We're fully compliant. So in this example, um, this is you know a paragraph that we wrote. Um, you know we were on the on the course to create a service catalog where basically people, our customers could come in to our organization and see a list their names, the list of the services that we provide. They'd click on it and they would get this. Uh, 
this illustrates basically how um, uh, we represented the customer's jobs. So here is the customer perspective. Um, we know that they have to propose and plan projects. We know that they have to have good solutions. They have to be on time, on budget. Those are the kinds of things that sort of drive them crazy. Um, they need to comply with requirements. And so how do we do that? Well, with respect to what we can do relative to project planning, um, we can prepare project file plans and project quality plans. Now, you, I, you won't remember, but if you pretend you remember back up at that um, gray box at the top that lists our services, we had those as two separate things. Those were in two separate groups and we offered those separately. We now collectively offer those. And we do that for free or we do that in an affordable way. And we do it at an appropriate level. That was the other concern that they had basically, you know, in the sort of the pains and gains space is we were perceived as applying one size fits all, which indeed we don't do that. So um, by basically color coding uh, in terms of, you know, as we reviewed the services, as we wrote them up, we could verify that we were indeed addressing what needed to be addressed. So in this last slide, uh, just to recap the whole rest of the story in terms of the case study, uh, we had criteria, we scored each of the services with respect to whether it was like really required or not really required at all, um, whether it had value or, um, or little value, whether there was demand, how well the delivery was going. Um, I mean, in some cases, things were required and were really hard to envision any value, but we then re-engineered it so it was as painless as possible for our researchers. Um, we went on and assessed, you know, what did we leave as, with, as is, what did we improve, what did we drop? We did drop uh, seven of our, what we ended up with with 100 services. Um, we identified 33 that needed to be improved. We ranked those then and then would subsequently move into uh, um, uh, Im improvement efforts. So this whole effort, as I described, it was about 400 labor hours, uh, but recognizing that uh, a lot of those hours were basically one-time investments. Some of it was figuring out how do you do this, uh, the other was uh, the, the jobs. The jobs are the jobs for our customers. And so other functional orgs can take advantage of that and use that in their efforts. So what came out of this is consolidated um, and much more clear services. Uh, integrated delivery, um, we had some increased demand of, a, of the services uh, that were involved. And we're getting much better quality inputs, you know, on the, for example, on the performance assessment side, we used to get these sort of quick and dirty responses, very brief. Now they're much more comprehensive and on target. Um, so Chris is going to step back in and talk about how this is this, the kind of learning that has gone on here is uh, being uh, addressed in uh, a subsequent investment in our organization and in some other places at the lab. Yeah, thanks, Steve. I, I guess, yeah, I'll talk about a couple of examples where we've used this approach. Uh, what Steve just talked about was a little bit of eating our own dog food or drinking our own champagne, however you wanna look at it, uh, where we were looking at our own services that we were providing. But a couple of examples where we've done something similar for other organizations in the lab. Uh, I work a lot with our finance and our business services organization. And one way that we use this technique was when we were looking at a new way of doing planning and budgeting. 
we've been doing it the same way forever. You know, the lab's been there for 50 years and sure it's evolved over time as technology has evolved, but it's been pretty much the same. So we started with the value proposition type exercise. We went through everything Steve talked about here, the, the customers, pains, gains, the services we were providing and came up with a nice succinct one page value proposition for doing planning and budgeting at the lab. That gave us the basis for not only doing some improvements within the organization, but also when it came time to do the IT investments, actually more than just IT, people process technology investments to, to make things better. We had a lot of the basis for the business case. We had already done a lot of the legwork to understand what was going to be valuable, what was working, what wasn't working. So that when it came time to put the business case together, we were in a really good position to make, uh, make the case and get the funding to go forward with that. Likewise, uh, another example is based on this set of services that, that Steve laid out here. We're also doing a similar sort of thing for what we're calling our assurance management uh, digital platform. Today, we have a lot of disparate systems that have cropped up that solve a very specific problem. We have an issue management system. We have something for dealing with requirements. Uh, we have all sorts of those. Well, we're now gonna take a step back and look at how could we maybe put something together that's a little more, not a little more, a lot more consolidated, a lot more integrated so that people don't have to jump around to do those things. Well, one of the first things we need to do is figure out what kinds of functionality we need in such a digital platform. Having these services defined gives us a huge leg up on understanding that. We've basically defined the functionality that we need in an assurance management digital platform through this exercise. So it can really help in several different fronts. It can help just in understanding where you're at. It can help in understanding, maybe making some process improvements. If it all gets all the way out to IT and other technology investments, it really gives you a good groundwork for that too. And I think that was pretty much what we had for the canned part of the presentation. So there's Holly materializing in the upper corner there. It's like magic. Oh, thank you both so much for, for sharing this experience. I love how you guys have taken what you do, what your internal customers do and what their pains are and put all of that together in a way that resonates with them and their experiences to drive their adoption and their use of, of the services that you guys provide. Um, we've got a few questions that have already come in, so please feel free to continue to put your questions in the Q&A. Um, I've also seen some people pop up in the chat, so I've been tracking those. Um, we will try to get to all of your questions. If we do not get to your question, I will work with Chris and Steve to follow up and make sure everybody's questions get answered, okay? All right, so the first one we have, gentlemen, is companies not having a burning platform, uh, meaning successful cus customers typically are less focused on developing a structured process framework. How have you mitigated this? Or has that been an issue? Yeah, in our organization, um, because of the strong compliance focus, you know, um, I guess what I would say is we have a slow smoldering platform that's smoldering all of the time um, because we're always really on the lookout to ensure that we are complying with government requirements. And the uh, Department of Energy is continually monitoring, assessing our performance and identifies opportunities for improvement for us as well. And so um, we have a strong process culture, basically our book of rules on how, uh, on what people have to do are basically process diagrams with um, detailed sort of steps that go along with them. We do uh, analytical process diagrams to build our IT tools. And so uh, we have a, a strong process focus in the organization. Excellent. I guess I would add, we, we had a, a platform that was burning a little hotter about 10 years ago when we embarked on transitioning from what Steve called it, the book of rules. We used to have stacks and stacks of 
documents that described everything that we needed to do. 10 or so years ago, we decided to take a process oriented approach. So that was actually where our team uh, came from or, or came to be was in taking all of the words that we lovingly call business ramblings and turning it into a process approach, taking it from a document centric to a process centric way of looking at what those requirements are and what we need to do to be compliant with it. So it was a little hotter then, but now it's more, like Steve said, smoldering. We, we come in and we help people to take it to the next level. Excellent, thank you. Um, one of the questions that came early in was they wanted to know what methodologies you use to identify what your services really were. So how did you go through and identify that 125 services? Um, well, yeah, actually, that's yeah, what I said in the slide is we okay. said, okay, well, we've got these services. Let's see what they are. And lo and behold, nothing was written down. So it was... Um, basically um, just sort of investigative journalism, um, asking, asking questions, uh, breaking things apart. Uh, I was sort of in the middle of that. And so one of the advantages of being at the lab for 45 years is you know a lot of what's, about what's going on. And so uh, it was in a position of, well, what, what about this and how does, how does this get done? And well, what does this mean? And could this mean this? And you know that uh, Chris can speak for himself, but he's also got 35 years and he understands how things work. And that's sort of basically his space as well. So it'd be a little bit harder if we had, uh, you know, one of our newbies that was, you know, two years in the lab, they would have had a lot harder time at it. But it basically was just uh, some elbow grease and digging into the details. Using your experience and, and the fact that you got gentlemen have been there for so many of those projects to then kind of go through and do that list out and then talk with some of the other people or people who you guys have worked with in the past. Yeah, well, and, and uh, the, I think we're all familiar with the concept of business rules uh, and business rules is you have a, a known structured vocabulary and you write succinct single topic sentences. So we weren't writing business rules, but we were writing titles that used um, defined terms and were you know very clearly stated in English. And so um, some of them were a little verbose and we had to tighten them up, but they got across what was being done. And by then sharing that and people said, oh yeah, that's what I do, or no, that's not right. And then to correct us, they told us exactly what they were doing. Yeah, there, there's a ton of value simply in the act of writing it down. Right? Indeed. I, I can't, countless times we've, I've gone and talked to people and said, you know, talk to me about how it works. Oh, we just know. And I, okay, well, tell me and I'll write it down. And they have a hard time articulating and actually getting it out. They know it in their head, but getting it down on paper, so to speak, and then being able to review it and understand it, there's a ton of benefit just in doing that. The, the marriage between process and, and knowledge management, I think is a beautiful thing. It helps us kind of put all of that, that information together. Um, we had, and this is, I think, just a confirmation question. Um, one of the people asked earlier, you had 125 services. That's a lot of details. Um, and they wanted to know if you shared all of that with all your internal customers, or it, it sounded like you guys also kind of then packaged them by different areas and groups that you support. So they have access to the ones that are relevant to them. Uh, it, yeah, indeed. Um, only a, a fraction of those 120, well, the 125 got boiled down to about hundred. Um, by sort of grinding through the process, but only a fraction of those are applied to the jobs of um, each of our customer sets. Mm -hmm. And that's what we were trying to uh, achieve with that service catalog, if you will, is, uh, is a customer could come in, they could see their, their role, you know, researcher, line manager, uh, m and program manager, they could click on that, and then they could just see the 
the appropriate services written from their perspective that were applicable to them. So uh, indeed what they saw was, which was a much smaller subset. Now wrangling all that, you know, basically we had to do that mapping in a database and, you know, get all of the relationships and so forth, which was part of that 400 hours. Uh, but once it was mapped, we were in pretty good shape. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question we had is, how did you get people to see the value of process governance or governance processes? They're to protect the company from risk, but basically provide no direct value to the employees. So it sounds like that's a big driver for you guys in general is the risk issue and the compliance issue, correct? Go ahead, Chris. <laughs> you let me take this one, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, I took the easy ones. Yeah, there you go. Um, I, I guess one way to look at that is we're helping people to do the right thing. It's also been my experience that, like if you talk about assessing risk on a project, um, exaggerating for effect, but the way the processes we have set up today and the way it works, a lot of people view that as a gate that they have to get through to get their funding. In order for me to get my funding, I have to do a risk assessment. So I'll jump through that hoop. The trick is really to frame it such that they see value in doing that risk assessment. And nobody, I would say nobody, if I were to say to a, a project manager, yeah, yeah, just go ahead and get going. If you're going to use some nasty chemicals, yeah, whatever, figure it out as you go. They, they would likely go, hey, wait, whoa, no, 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 I need to know before. But looking at it, looking at it from that perspective of, yeah, I need to understand the chemicals I'm working at so that nobody gets hurt and so that it, everything goes like it's supposed to. They see it from that perspective. But now, dude, you need to do a risk assessment. You can't get your funding until you do your risk assessment. And it's just a little bit different mindset. So that's a long way around to the good old, I think I put it in the chat, what's in it for them perspective. And, and framing it so that it is of value, it is of benefit. They see the common sense reason why they would do it in addition to the, well, it's a rule and you have to do it. Yeah, I, one of the things that uh, we did a few years back is we assessed um, projects gone wrong. And so we had R&D projects that went wrong for a variety of reasons. Uh, you know, and these aren't really like risks associated with hazardous chemicals. It's like, well, um, this project did poor planning. This project didn't have a QA plan and they used the wrong data in their calculation. This project did this wrong and that wrong. Uh, and uh, so you basically can, and we also did projects gone right. And so when people see uh, well, if I don't plan ahead for long-term actions, I can have these problems. They can kind of see the value in planning. Um, they can see the value in having QA if it can avoid um, basically the horrific outcome of one particular project that I'm thinking of. So, um, but we can all, you can, you can frame it in a way that it's not jumping through a hoop. It's by going through this, basically you're paying me now rather than paying later. And usually paying now is a $50 oil filter versus a $1,000 ring job. All right, so the next question is actually somebody wanting to kind of understand how these pieces fit together. Um, can you understand how process services and the jobs are kind of integrated and do you have a hierarchy involved there? Um, I guess multiple pieces there. Um, well, there are some jobs that are inter interconnected. Um, we try, we associated, I'm not sure I'm answering the question. We did associate um, jobs with sort of specific services. Um, so no, in terms of the hierarchy, um, sort of which came first, um, I think, sort of figuring out what your uh, domain is by describing your services uh, was probably 
makes sense uh, in terms of, because you have that context in mind when you're um, asking questions around the jobs. I'm not sure I answered the question. Chris, maybe you have a, a little bit better discernment on. It, yeah, I guess, I guess one way to look at it is that in a lot of ways, a process, the way we tend to talk about it is stringing together a bunch of services to get something done. So, so there's that natural integration. Now, how well do we have that structured in data someplace to where you could run a query and say, show me all the services that come into play on that process? We're starting to evolve to that as, as we're looking at more traditional uh, business architecture type approaches to documenting what we're doing. Historically, we've done a lot of process analysis, boxes and arrows, put the picture together. Cool, you've got that. But being able to then relate that to other processes. Um, I, I noticed there was a question in the chat about the process management platform that we use. We use a product called iServer from Orbis. And mm -hmm. not at all an endorsement. That's simply what we use. But it allows us to put use Visio as a diagramming tool and then extract the, the information out of Visio into the iServer database so that we can start to do some of these connections within iServer, the business architecture part of iServer. We could define what the services are, what the processes are, the relationships between the two so that we could start to see those interconnections in a more structured way. Likewise, define the roles um, on our process models today on each activity we identify the role that's responsible. Having that also in data to where we could then, when we want to do something like show me all of the uh, jobs for a customer, it could be a query against the iServer database where we use the role as the customer, pull out all the processes that that, that uh, role participates in and or the services that are consumed. Those are, those are some of the next level things we're talking about for integrating. But also it almost kind of sounds like um, if you look at the processes you guys use, the services you provide and the jobs for the client, the services and the jobs are what, right? The services are what you do. Uh, the jobs are what your internal customers do. And then the process is how you support them. And then the same thing, you've got that underlying then what they're doing as well is gonna have a process underneath that. So it's kind of the what and then the how kind of underneath that is if you want to decompose in that way. Sure. And uh, I, I guess another uh, point of integration, you know, if you follow this through sort of systematically across other functional organizations, you know, you can think in terms of an R&D project life cycle. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have to propose it and you get your funding and you plan the work and you uh, compile your assets and you execute the research and, and you write your results and Etc. cetera, um, by mapping. So we have services that map to, you know, the QA plan during project planning to records management at the tail end, uh, maybe some other process techniques that we use where we've defined uh, some research processes for research projects to help them do a complicated. But if, ever, if all of the functions did that, basically, as the researcher was executing their research function, they could see the services that everybody applied to what they were trying to accomplish. Because you know, a researcher in our book of rules has a, a step where they submit a travel expense report, for example. That's not their job. Their job is to collaborate. Their job is to interact with the customer uh, by the way, I have to travel to be able to do that. So traveling is not their job. Interacting with the customer, interacting with the collaborator is their job. Basically doing travel administrivia is a pain in the neck. And so how do we make that in a way that en is enabling, is of value to them in terms of being able to interact with their customer or collaborator? Okay, it looks like we have time for one or two more questions. I'm gonna go with it. Uh, a relatively helpful, easy one, which is where does the performance management group sit within your organization? So where are you guys hierarchically structured? Go ahead, Chris. Your line management. 
no comment on that. Um, <laughs> in terms of the structure, there, there's NNL, the lab, and then the next level down we call directorates. And we are one of the management and operations directorates. So our director reports to the lab director. So we're at level one, I guess you would call it within the organization. And then our team is down underneath there. So performance management itself is right up there in what you might call the C-suite. In fact, our chief risk officer is the director of performance management. Right. Okay, right, we have one more question. Like I said, we will get to everybody's question and FAQ that comes out of this and I'll make sure you guys all get a copy of it. Um, one of the last, one of the questions we had in the chat is how do you avoid the I'm too busy to solve problems mindset within teams? Mm -hmm. The I'm too um, busy. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, I think, uh, well, the way I address that is um, I've got so many examples in the quiver, I guess, of people who taken a, oh, I, I guess we could call that sort of being short-sighted of that sort of short-sighted thinking coming back to bite them. Uh, on the backside, um, I think, you know, we can make some compelling arguments um, that, you know, it's pay me now or pay me later. Or, um, or you know, if, if you don't identify efficiencies here, you're just not going to be able to survive. You know, we've had, uh, we had a spell there where there was some tighter budgets on the functional side and, and people were just getting burned out because their processes were so inefficient. And so at some point, you know, you have to um, take the step to bring in that efficiency. You know, it's like uh, somebody who's busy and they bring on some additional help, but they're too busy to show the help how to do the work. Um, you know, it's basically the same kind of thing. And it sounds like a mixture of those, those pain points from the, the research you guys did connecting to those internal customers, along with some of those examples of what went wrong for people yeah. so they could see themselves in it and then what went right so they could see the potential there. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right, unfortunately that is all the time, all the questions, time we have for questions today. Um, however, you guys will get a copy of the slides. Um, we have some additional information on this topic. We actually have a case study that we did with these gentlemen um, looking at their program and some of the work that they've done. Uh, we also have several other pieces of research that look at employee engagement um, for process work and help changing towards that process thinking mindset. Um, you can stay up to date on our research agenda. Um, and also I'm always on the lookout for, for understanding how other organizations are, are doing these things. Um, so let me know if you have a case study or you just would like to talk about this topic. And then finally, um, also stay on the outlook for our events. We have roundtables that have been going on fairly regularly. Our next one is scheduled for September 16th. Uh, our roundtables where we get a small group of members like yourselves together to have a conversation about challenges and solutions on specific topics. The one on the 16th is going to be on process improvement. And you can also always attend our monthly webinar. Next month, we'll be looking at the survey results from our biannual framework survey. So I look forward to seeing you all there. Connect with us wherever you live. Um, and I thank you all uh, for attending this webinar. Chris, Steve, thank you very much for, for participating and sharing your story and your insights with everybody. It's been a pleasure working with you on this today. Well, thank you. It was a thank lot of you. fun. We appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Uh, everyone, I hope you have a great day. Alrighty, have fun. <laughs>